Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel. I just want to wish everybody a very happy new year wherever you are. And I hope that 2021 serves to be a very, very special year for you and that everything that you wish for, all your dreams come true. So love to each and every one of you and happy, happy new year. But before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up. Let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, My name is Ivan and I was born and raised in Redmond that is in close proximity to downtown Seattle during the 80s era. The expansive location of Redmond was highly forested in those days, but over the last 30 years the trees have been cleared away to make way for housing developments and business enterprises. Yet despite all these modifications and alterations, the area still boasts a uniquely small town feel about it and still possesses a warm, friendly ambience among all the residents who live here. Although much has indeed changed and appears to be seemingly unrecognisable to the Redmond that I once knew growing up as a young boy, needless to say all these years later it is a very pleasant part of the world to still live, which I do. I was raised by my very strict parents, who were old enough to be my grandparents. It would seem that my mother battled to conceive in her younger years, and a couple of years before she entered the menopause, she miraculously discovered that she was actually pregnant with me. Even my mother's gynaecologists were amazed by this unexpected twist of events, which was never ever anticipated, and to say that I was not planned for is an understatement, if ever there was one. The only way that I can actually describe my childhood is both challenging and tumultuous, as my authoritarian parents believe that children should be seen and never heard. They literally raised me with a very stiff upper lip, in a very disciplined, regimental and structured way. If I misbehaved in any way, my stern, no-nonsense father would give me a very severe lashing with a studded belt, and I remember there were times that I could barely sit down it hurt that much. My uncompromising father would constantly be quoting the Bible verse, He who spares the rod hates his own son. And for him it was a righteous confirmation from God that I should be frequently whipped. Let's just say it gave him a rite of passage to lash out at me whenever he chose, like a nasty vicious viper. And he'd always tell me a hard spanking was very good for the soul, and it wouldn't do me any harm. As a child growing up, I was so fearful of my father's belt that I always felt I had to walk on eggshells lest I did anything wrong to warrant a good lashing or at the very least a very bad scolding to put me firmly in my place. If I dared to steal a cookie from the larder or come down to dinner with my hair looking dishevelled, I'd get a huge beating for presenting myself at the table in such a disrespectful, inappropriate way. The only way I can describe it is like growing up in a very strict boarding school under the supervision of a cantankerous old draconian headmaster. This pretty much was what it was like growing up under the steely hawk eyes of my two controlling, peritonaceous parents, who were to put simply as humorless as a headless chicken. I grew up in such a charmless, loveless, austere environment that was much more regimental, military and ordered rather than loving, congenial and warm. I believe my childhood rarely influenced who I became as an adult, so I am now a very introvert, reticent and somewhat aloof man. I don't mean to be that way, but that is what my childhood made me become. I have always failed to express my emotions and inevitably have battled and struggled with contentious issues that arise that would inevitably cause discord, disharmony or division in my family, as I have always been so desperate to keep the peace under every circumstance. When I was old enough, I left home and began plodding away at a local bank in downtown Seattle to make a living, and not long after that I married and moved into a decent home in a green, leafy, attractive suburb in Redmond. It wasn't far from my parents' original home. In those days I was recognised by the bank for some of my innovative, pioneering, ingenious and inspirational ideas and so I was promoted and soon earning a sizable income, which was very much appreciated by my wife, who loved splashing out on extravagances at every turn. 
My strange, rather peculiar story that I'm about to share with you and your listeners has literally changed my life miraculously, in ways that I would never have foreseen or envisaged at all. In what I can only say is a life-altering, transformative experience, from where I emerged from the confines of a solitary cocoon and literally metamorphosized into a butterfly. And I owe this change in my character to my very strange, bizarre encounter with what I now know to be a Bigfoot. In those days I had absolutely no idea what this incredulous, majestic and lofty creature actually was, and I pondered over what I had seen for many years, keeping the secrets of my strange encounter locked up in my mind under bolt and key, until now of course. It all began when my younger daughter Emma was being persuaded somewhat forcefully by my effusive wife to enter these beauty pageants around North America that offered incredible prizes like cars and tons of money. My eager wife became animated in her enthusiasm in dressing my little kid up to look just like a Barbie doll and much, much older than her natural age, and she was very young at the time. My daughter was plastered with layers of makeup and expensive costumes that were so provocative I actually felt like I wanted to throw up. It made me sick to my stomach and nauseous to see my little kid being exploited like this by my own wife. Yet, in my fearful dread of confrontation of every kind, I just bit my lip and held my tongue. Inside my heart I felt like a raging volcano that wanted to burst out its bubbly molten lava everywhere. But I suppressed it all and buried my feelings, much like a squirrel storing away its stash of acorns, over the winter. I loved and adored my wife with every single breath of my being, but her obsession with dressing my daughter up like this was driving me crazy. When would it ever stop, I would wonder? She would spend copious amounts of money getting Emma's outfits fastidiously styled by professional up-and-coming designers where no expense was ever spared. We're talking about thousands of dollars that was spent on this ridiculous, obscene and tasteless enterprise. I felt that I was torn between a rock and a hard place because I was desirous to see my wife happy, of course, but seeing my daughter's hair layered up on her head with curls and locks in a very sophisticated grown-up hairstyle with lashings of thick makeup seemed almost reprehensible to me. If that wasn't bad enough, she was learning how to wiggle her tiny hips with swaggering, gyrating dance moves and pouting her lips in such a suggestive way that would quite frankly have even made a sailor blush. My daughter was learning very provocative, enticing dance moves from this teacher of hers who was inspiring my daughter to dance like a stripper. And she was also taking singing lessons so that she could perform very well on stage and sing like a star in her baby voice. Emma seemed to naturally be enjoying and delighting in all the fuss and attention that she was receiving from my wife. But I just felt it was so unhealthy and unwholesome for a young girl of my daughter's age to be ensnared in such an artificial world where the focus was on looking good as if nothing else in life mattered. It was not the kind of value system that I was desirous to instill in my daughter. I felt in my heart that this was teaching my daughter a warped kind of morality because she was so much more than her outer appearance. She was my adorable little girl. I was naturally concerned that she would grow up to be a dolly bird, having multiple surgeries so that she could end up looking exactly like a Barbie doll in order to feel that she had any self-esteem or worth. And that idea was just abhorrent to me. I'm ashamed to say that I bit my lip and said nothing. I was always having these inward arguments telling myself to man up and step up and put my foot down and tell my wife that this had to stop. But I just couldn't do it because I have to admit I was spineless, cowardly and timorous. In those days my wife was unable to drive and so it was up to me to ferry her all around North America on these crazy, frivolous little fanciful jaunts, where all the excessively expensive entry fees would make up all the prize money so that you could invariably walk away with thousands of dollars if you were a winner or even a car. I never wanted to be a member of the audience at these events, as those events were largely full of women, 
so I had to find ways to busy myself while all these crazy showtime shenanigans were all going on. More often than not, I would visit local towns, go and see a movie, or ride on my bicycle, which I always brought along with me to various beauty pageants. The worst part of these events was the pitiful, downcast, disheartened expressions on my daughter and wife's face after an event. It's absolutely disgusting, my wife would say. Emma was by far the most beautiful girl there. But she didn't get a look in from those prejudiced judges. There's something nefarious going on, because the judges are always picking the same girls every time at every beauty pageant. It never changes. Anyone could see that Emma was by far the best. I didn't win, Daddy, my little girl would cry. The judges think the other girls are prettier than me. Well, the judges were wrong, I said. I would assure my girl that she was very pretty and she was Daddy's very special girl. Never again, my wife would say. I'll be damned if I'm going to be exploited by a bunch of partisan judges who are probably receiving backhanders as I speak to promote the very same girls over and over again. It's a highly nefarious operation and those judges are as crooked as bent trees. I don't trust them at all. I kid you not, three days after that bold, startling confession from my wife, she was once again enrolling Emma into yet another competition. It was like she'd become a hamster on a spinning wheel that just couldn't stop spinning around and round on this roller coaster of intrigue and bizarre, unhealthy addiction to beauty pageants. My startling story begins when I actually dropped my wife and daughter off at the local beauty pageant in Kentucky, where the winnings were extremely attractive, from a flashy car to thousands of dollars to be won in prize money. I decided to take my bike for a long ride in a countrified area that was surrounded by a vast expanse of natural woodland. There was a particular wooded area that had got my attention because it looked so statuesque and imposing with towering trees that stood up straight in the heavens like long vertical giants. I knew these trees were hundreds of years old and I loved their gnarled roots and the huge trunks that were covered in layers of green Spanish moss. I couldn't help but run my hands across the bark in rapturous awe because I knew these incredible tour de force of nature had indeed eclipsed my existence by many lifetimes. I entered the woods and for a moment my thoughts were transferred to the mystical beauty of this breathtaking place, which became even more awe-inspiring and alluring as I discovered a glorious gushing stream with a vigorous current meandering through the woods, and the sounds of the water along with the chirping and the warbles of birds was very enchanting. The gurgling stream was surrounded by lots of rocky outcrops and I found one rock that was shaped like a king's throne and was very close to the water where I chose to sit down. I unravelled my turkey sandwich because I had begun to get rather hungry that I had brought at the local town along with a bottle of lemonade and proceeded to eat and drink. I started to feel tired and sleepy and before long I would actually drifted into a deep sleep with my upper torso pressing comfortably against the rocky headstone. I was suddenly awoken to this terrible whimpering sound that sounded like an animal or human was in distress. It was a cry of someone in dreadful, excruciating pain, and it was a sound I shan't forget in a hurry. I woke with a start and listened intently. The painful cries continued for a long time with this intensive chattering sound that sounded rather like two people speaking gibberish in a very earnest tone. I peered over the side of the rock where I'd been sleeping, and then I saw them. There were three of them. One that was clearly the alpha male, and then there was a female and a younger one. But what on earth were they? I could hardly imagine. I was so stunned by what I was seeing, almost as if I'd actually seriously been shocked by a taser gun. That's how disorientated I felt. I'd never seen giant creatures like this before, as these critters were monstrously big in their girth, width and stature, and the male was easily over ten foot tall, and that's without exaggeration. They were built like army tanks, with powerful sinewy muscular definition, especially noticeable on the shoulder area and the biceps. I observed that they were covered in the very dark flowing brown hair, with heads that were shaped like bullets that seamlessly just folded into the shoulders without really much evidence of a neck. If there was one, I didn't see it. 
It was what they were doing that actually got my attention. The little critter that was only five foot tall seemed to be holding his jaw with his hands and whimpering. I could tell that the poor thing was clearly in agonising pain, especially judging by the swelling in his jaw. I suspected he might have an abscess on his tooth or an infection. His two very concerned parents were trying to reach out to the poor little critter to help him as much as they could. But if their hands got close to his inflamed angry jaw, he would push them away with his overlong arm, whimpering loudly and protesting indignantly. The parents began to chatter away in a strange gibberish language, backwards and forwards to each other, and I knew they were arguing about what course of action should be taken for their child. I watched the child moving his body backwards and forwards in agitation as he clutched his jaw tightly and continued to whimper. Suddenly the male had seemingly had quite enough of all this whimpering, and he let out a thunderous growl that was so terrifying that I nearly jumped out of my skin and the hair on the back of my neck stood on end. This alpha male curled back his lips to reveal his very large teeth and he directed this angry growl towards the little critter. The vicious growl seemed to subdue the young critter somewhat, who immediately stopped whimpering. The male pounded his chest with his fists in what I imagine was a display of dominance, in an indignant way, as if he was asserting his authority towards his youngling and telling him who was boss. He then said something to the little critter in that gibberish language, who with troubled, frightened eyes obediently opened his mouth and jaw for his father to inspect, and this time he put up no resistance at all. The male critter was examining his youngling's jaw very intently, and when he found the inflamed area, he proceeded to pull out the offending tooth with his large, rather sausage-sized finger that you would have expected would be rather a clumsy instrument to use for tooth removal. But to my absolute amazement, he extracted the tooth rather effortlessly, which must have been down to his superhuman strength. Finally, he handed it to the young critter, who was studying it excitedly and jumping up and down for joy on his long, powerful legs with his tooth in his hands, which he displayed proudly. He was acting like someone who'd won the lottery. He was over the moon about his tooth, and he kept showing it over and over again to his parents in absolute delight. It was clear that the pain had gone, but immediately after the extraction, the mother handed her sprog some leaves to chew which I imagine must have possessed some anti-inflammatory properties, because these creatures obviously know how to take care of their own. Suddenly the whole family seemed so much happier, and then I watched them glide off into the forest with what I can only describe was a seamless grace. The first words that came out of my mouth were, What the heck was that? I couldn't fathom or understand what these critters actually were but they had taught me a valuable lesson in that extraordinary, rather surreal moment. The moment the male asserted his authority towards the youngling, and even the female critter, that was when my lesson was actually birthed, and when my eyes were finally opened to my responsibility and duty as a loving husband and protective father. I knew now what needed to be done. I had come into the woods as one man, and I was leaving as another. When the male critter demanded the youngling open its mouth, and it had obeyed immediately, and the problem was dealt with, and everybody was happy, I knew in that instant it was about time that I grew a backbone and started asserting a little authority around my own household, because this ridiculous desire to dress my kid up, to look like a Barbie doll, and so much older than she naturally was, had gone on long enough, and it was about time that it stopped. Later that day, as would be expected, both my wife and daughter returned to the car with very downcast, disheartened and disenchanted faces. It's happened again, said my wife, slamming the car door angrily behind her as she got into the seat beside me. Once again, the judges were so biased and they picked the same girls all over again. I'm telling you they're receiving backhanders. I know they are. Emma should have won. She's without question the most talented and the most beautiful of all the girls there. All right, I said, raising my voice to a tone a little lower than a shout. No daughter of mine is going to take part in a circus like this. And our daughter deserves a decent childhood. 
not being paraded around like a circus animal. You should be ashamed of yourself, Fiona, treating our daughter like a slice of eye candy to be exploited. Making our daughter look like she's an adult with all this makeup on is absolutely ridiculous. It's like you're playing dolls with our kid. Have you for a minute considered the long-term ramifications of what you're doing to our child? Finally, it would seem that the volcano had actually erupted and there was a startled silence in the car. And my wife looked at me with an expression of utter amazement on her face. But nobody said a word. The surprising thing is that never again did my daughter get involved in those crazy contests because my wife listened to me. She respected my decision and even years later admitted that it was a wise decision as far as my daughter was concerned for her to enjoy a normal childhood. These days I'm still introverted, but I do my very best to express my love to my family in ways that my parents failed with me. I force myself to show that affection and love to my family that goes way beyond my comfort zone. When things get out of control, I'm no longer afraid to express my indignation, and that is thanks to the male Bigfoot that showed me the importance of being assertive as man of the household. So there you are. That's my story. I just want to say thank you so very much for that incredible story. I can't imagine seeing a Bigfoot in the woods with terrible tooth pain. I've heard stories of tigers having, you know, abscesses and pain, and I don't know how animals cope with it because they don't have the dentistry we do. You know, even though they don't eat sweets, they still have gum disease, they still have infections in their mouths. And to see how this male Bigfoot knew how to deal with this problem and he demanded respect from his child was absolutely extraordinary. So thank you so much for sharing that story. And I must say, I'm so glad that your daughter isn't involved in those beauty contests. A lot of people would say that they're good for kids, but personally, I think that children should be able to be allowed to grow up and, you know, embrace the natural world before they, you know, get old before their time. I don't know what your opinion on that is. If you think that beauty pageants for a young kid are dreadful, do let me know. Until next time, goodbye and good night.